morning again, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Revelation in Focus. Today, just to recap, we've had a grand time last week when we spoke about the significance of the number seven in prophecy. We said there were seven stars, seven angels, seven churches, seven candlesticks, a number of references to the number seven and its significance in prophecy. Today, we go deeper. We want to look today at the church of Ephesus, the church at Ephesus. What is the importance of the name Ephesus? What is the importance of this particular aspect or phase of the Christian church? With us today in studio, I'm yours truly, Cleveland Hudson. We have Brother Union, Brother Mentor, as usual. Today is going to be no different as we journey continuously into the book of Revelation. Brother Union, Brother Mentor, the Church of Ephesus, identified as a prophetic phase. We had settled before that it was not only seven churches, but seven phases of the church or seven time periods of the church. What is the, the, the significance of the name Ephesus? Um, well, the name Ephesus actually means desirable. Mm -hmm. Desirable. Yes. And um, I think that that name desirable is for a good reason. All right? Because um, this church represented the first era of the church. Yeah. the first time period of the church. This represented the apostolic church. Mm -hmm. the, the new faith that was embraced, everyone was there with all their zest and their zeal and their, their loyalty to Christ. And, and so they were there buoyed up with joy to follow God and to do His will. And that's the time when the church would have experienced its, its, its purest state. Yes. You know, it's like, it's like, like they said, it, it meant something hot like first love. <laughs> it's fresh. First love you know, indeed. Yes. You know. And I would, want to, I would want to add in there that most of the folks here would have witnessed the closing scenes of Christ's ministry, his yes. resurrection and his, his death and burial and so forth. And so these things were fresh in their minds. In addition to that, uh, fresh from Pentecost yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. uh, that great uh, event that took place when the Spirit manifested himself as clo cloves of tongues. And we learned what happened with that. So this is basically that church that began there. Yeah. And um, that first love, that zeal and power, as you mentioned before. Which is a very that, desirable start for oh, the yes, Lord. Very desirable mm -hmm. indeed, very desirable indeed. In addition to that, we see uh, in this particular verse of Revelation, Revelation 2, uh, Christ is talking to the church and he's, he's, he's introducing himself in an interesting fashion. He's saying, these things said he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand. What an interesting way to identify himself, stars in his right hand. What is the significance of this? Stars in his right hand. What is Revelation alluding to? What is it? What is it referring to? Brother Union, Brother Mentor. Um, before we go to that, I'd uh -huh. like to make this point. Uh -huh. um, John was with this church from its inception. Yes. Right down to the end. Yes. So here we had this. Here we have John, mm -hmm. one of the disciples, John the Beloved, okay, mm -hmm. the one who wrote the book of Revelation, okay. Yes. Um, we have some information here. Um, the historian Eusebius records that John was sent to Patmos by Domitian, and when those who had been unjustly banished were released by his successor, okay, mm -hmm. Norva. The apostle returned to Ephesus. Okay. Now, um, 
John wrote the revelation during Domitian's reign, okay? And the records show that John was released in AD 96, okay? And because um, Domitian was assassinated, and just like when a new government, uh, a, a, a new president, you know, comes into office, mm -hmm. he, he, you know, he would um, pardon some people, you know, um, etc. So John was released in 1896, and according to, 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 to you know, the history, um, the, this first church, Ephesus, was the, the approximate time period of this church was 31 AD to 100. Okay. So John was there as, as one of the founder members. Understood. You know, and, and, so, and, and, so, so he would have had... And he guided the church, mm -hmm, etc. Mm -hmm. You know, as, so this was personal experience you know, coming as up here as well. Right? When those who founded something passed on, you know, <laughs> yes. so, was, so yes. John was there, you know, uh, 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 as the bulwark, you know, right. one who went with Christ. He was with Christ all the way through, had the experience and so forth, mm -hmm. and he was able to keep the church pure. Mm -hmm. by the so, so point clear, and and so uh, that that that's interesting background there. Yeah, in yeah. terms of the specific date and, and the, the, the approximation of the, of the time and so forth when this occurred. But going back to this whole significance of seven stars in his hand, I reckon that back then, and I want to say this again to our, our viewers in television land, the relevancy of the Book of Revelation. Though it's history, much of it is history in advance. We would have said this to you uh, from the inception. And so, lessons here to be learned from then can be seen as we go through. Now, back then, this importance of astrology and studying of stars was a crucial thing. A lot of people based their, 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 their that sense of direction and purpose on the position of stars and constellations. And so we find the prophet Daniel alluding to this, Daniel referred to this, when that whole uh, situation with Nebuchadnezzar and the dream, and he turned to his wise men, and they couldn't explain to him the dream. And so referring to that, now we're talking about seven stars, the importance of stars. Um, Daniel is saying in Daniel 2, 26, 27, God here alone knows the future and controls the universe. Now, don't you see a connection there with now? Aren't there people today who write stuff in the papers, mm -hmm. talking about the different constellations mm -hmm. in the heavens? They mm -hmm. talk about Aries, they talk yeah. about Sagittarius, yeah. and all these different things. These are all call constellations. Them, call themselves stargazers. Yeah, and they look so. and they're able to see the future by looking at the stars. But here it is in Revelation 2, Who's holding the stars? Jesus Christ. God himself. Uh -huh. Christ himself. Mm -hmm. He has not left this to any other person. All right. So if we want to look to somebody who controls destiny, who has authority on future, we can't right. look to mankind. Mm -hmm. We got to look to who? Yeah. We got to look to, to Christ. Exactly. Because because you like you're saying, mm -hmm. like these people believe in this this star as a as a guiding principle uh, offering directions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so therefore, who control your stars control you. Yes. So therefore the stars are in the hands of Christ. Yes. So it shows that he's in control. He is in control. And um he's it, this is interesting because he's introducing himself this way to Ephesus. There is a connection there with how Christ is introducing himself and what we will see as we go along in the verses. So, yes. so, so first, the stars, and notice it's in which hand? The right hand. Now, there's always a significance with right hand right and hand power. Power hand, man. <laughs> power hand. And control, right? right? Exactly. Right? So not only does he control the church, mm -hmm. right? But he, 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 his power sustains the church. Mm -hmm. And also being in his hands, what, what, what do we use our hands for? What does a mother use her hands for? Okay. The care of her children. Care and nurture. So, so, exactly. so, so, so here it is. Mm -hmm. Christ is. Christ is the one who cares for the church, mm -hmm. who nurtures the church, who protects and shields the church, whose power upholds 
and sustains the church. So that does only he control it. Uh, I think that's the least of his, of his concern. He's more concerned in caring and nurturing and, 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 and maintaining and keeping the church in good exactly. stead. The Brother Union, isn't it true? He said that those in his hand, nobody can pluck it out. That's right. <laughs> so he, he has the church. He also makes um, a statement when he says, the gates of hell will not prevail against, against, it, against the right. church. And all these mm -hmm. things are said out of his love for the church. His love for it's, the it, church. It, it, it's not that uh, good I the power hearts and I can stop them. No. But this power is not being used selfishly. It's generated it, it, by it, love. Man. Because he loves his church. Man. Right. And so, so this whole aspect of control, of, of authority, of, of, of foundation, the church, the foundation of the church is Jesus Christ. Yeah. Not people, not even the leaders. The leaders of the church are in whose hand? But, but, but it starts with the leaders. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's in his hand. Leaders. Right? And right. It, it's in his hand. Yeah. He, he's he's controlled. And, and David made, makes mention of this when David says, um, David says in Psalms that it, it, it is God who upholdeth the leaders with his right hand. Now know it either. The Lord saveth his anointed. He will hear him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Yeah. His right hand. So, there we go. Scripture on scripture, yes. as we did say. The right. point here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the church has been under attack from its inception. Yes. Okay? We're talking here specifically about the Christian church. Mm -hmm. Well, from creation, all that God established has been attacked by the devil. Yes. But we deal now here specifically with the seven churches, mm -hmm. or the first church and then coming down the line. Mm -hmm. The reason why the church has withstood all the attacks of the enemy, etc., is because it's God's church. Yes. All right. You understand? Yes. Bible and, and, says the apple of His eye. And the church would always be. And holds His supreme That's regard. Right. Exactly. The church would be until time changes mm -hmm. into eternity. Yes. So we need to understand that God is guiding the church. Yes. If you speak for what they pass through, the church would always be because. The foundation of the church is on the rock, Christ Jesus. Wonderful. Uh, in addition to holding the stars, the, the stars in his hand, there's something else he says. He walketh among the candlesticks. Yes. Now, this is interesting. Who's walking among the seven candlesticks? Who's moving in and around the church? Who's operating? Who's, who's guiding the affairs of the church? Christ himself. Yes. yes. And we can, we can support this mm. with what he said in Matthew, um, Matthew 28, 20. Exactly. I am with you. Always. Even until? The end of the world. End of the world. So as Brother Union, as you said just now, when the end comes, the church will prevail. That's right. Okay. Because he's saying, I will be with you always, even until the end right. of the world. And so Christ himself is walking in and among the church. This says to us that even though the church looks defective, looks weak, looks as though it's going to fall, who's upholding it? The Lord himself. <laughs> the Lord himself is <laughs> he's, he's in and among his people to guide them to fulfill his promises to them. Yes. And um, so he's between the kind of six themselves, which, which, which represent the churches, and he holds the leadership of the church in, in his, his hand. right hand. So if he holds the leadership in his hand, by extension, he's holding the church. Of course, because the, the, the shepherds of the flock got to guide. All right. And they're not doing it out of their own, right? They're doing it based on, right. So exactly. I sustain the leadership so that the leadership can take care of the membership. Wonderful, wonderful. And so as we continue, um, in verse, uh, we go on to what Christ mentions here. He begins now to commend the church. Mm -hmm. Verse 2 to verse 3, I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou hast not, has not bear them which are evil. He's beginning to commend the church. Mm -hmm. Now, is this something new? With Christ validating good works, is this something new? Isn't this something 
that we have seen throughout scripture? Yes, even 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 the story with um with Cain and Abel. Mm -hmm. He asked Cain, he said, "Why are your, why is your countenance fallen? Mm -hmm. You know, if you do well, wouldn't you be accepted?" <laughs> of course. So so the Lord is saying, "Look, I'm 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 not here to just tell you when things are wrong. I'm here to encourage you when, when things are right and to commend you when things are right." Mm -hmm. So there's validation with God. Yeah. And we have several other stories in the in, in, in the Gospels. The woman with the issue of blood, daughter, thy faith had made thee whole. Yeah. The centurion that said to him, look, you don't need to come to my house. You just say the word and it's going to happen. And Christ said, I have not seen faith like this in all Israel. So this is nothing new. Yeah. This is the nature of God yeah. uh, to validate and to encourage uh, and to commend good works. Yeah. He does that, okay? Mm -hmm. So he talks about this in verse 2 and verse 3. Now, that's not the only thing he does. He doesn't only validate and commend for good works. What does he do when something is wrong? Now we see there again um, in verses 4. 4, right. 4 and 5. Yeah. What he says? Nevertheless, I have something against you. Now, yeah. what the Bible says concerning what God does when something is wrong, who the Lord loveth he what? Chastene. And rebukes. And corrects. That's right. And we are told that we must not despise the, the chastening, chastening of the Lord. Lord. That's right. Right? Mm -hmm. Because he's not, you said it just mm -hmm. now, he's not doing it out of hate, but out of what? Love. He's doing it out of love. So whatever God is saying to his church, whether it's commending, validating, or in the, in, in the other case, uh, correcting, reproving, it's out of love. It's love is church. Now, we, 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 we hear our parents. Yep. We know um, what it is uh, to have uh, children, whether it's in the church family, mm. whether it's biological. Yeah. And would you want to see your young people go astray? No way. No. You won't want to see your home go in disarray. You're going to correct. Exactly. Right? But what we must notice, God connects, then corrects. Mm. Right. So this is all about relationship. Mm. Right. Uh, between God and his church, his body. Okay? Um, so, so he has a problem, and what is the problem that he's denouncing here? What's the problem he's talking about with Ephesus? Um, what he has, yeah. They, they, they have lost their first love, mm -hmm. um, meaning that it's not that they, they do not love him anymore, but for whatever prevailing circumstance exists, uh, their love has somewhat diminished, mm -hmm. right? Um, some of the zeal has died off, you know, it has spitted off. It's, it's, it's like, it, it happens in human human relations every day. You know, um, sometimes we, we buy a new piece of clothing and we're all excited about it and you know, and we cannot wait to wear it. And after a few wearings, it start wearing off and we start seeing other clothing that look nice and all. So it's, 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 it's a normal human experience. And, and, and the Lord is saying, no, this is not good enough. Right? No doubt it would have been occasioned by some, some false teachings and doctrines exactly. and misconceptions that crept into the church and some of the leadership has become weary with constantly trying to, to, to guide back the membership and, and some of the members no doubt would have, would have torn between two opinions etc. And all that helped to contribute to that um, lessening down and that, 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 that cooling down of that zeal and that yes. zest and that, you know what I mean, kind of thing. And the Lord so, was saying... So, as pure about. as the church was, with the zeal and all the refresh experiences, the miraculous unfoldings of Pentecost, somewhere along the line, scientific doctrines got interwoven and interfered with the original doctrines. And so, their first love began to get weaned and weak mm. and and christ saw what was happening and pointed it out yeah. look something's happening here yes and let's 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 remember mm -hmm. that um we need to look at whatever happens in christendom 
on a whole. Yes. From the perspective of the great controversy. Yes. Remember, the church is God's church. Yes. Remember, the enemy is there. Mm -hmm. And we need to look at it from the perspective of the great controversy. Satan is always working, yes. you know, and, 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 and trying to corrupt, yes. you know, whatever God instituted. Mm -hmm. And so he brought in the, you know, these corruptions started, right? So we need to look at it from that, you know, yes. aspect. And we can we can match that with, with the Gospels. Mm -hmm. What was said, where the Lord planted his vineyard, and yeah. when he came back, mm -hmm. he saw tears among yeah. the wheat. Yes. And the, the servants were confused. You didn't plant tears, you plant wheat, but you see tears. Yeah. So in the church, and that's the relevance today. Um, today is no different. We're within the church. We can have springing up yeah. Yeah. divisions. Mm -hmm. People mm -hmm. who come up with these strange light yeah. or new light, and then sometimes we can have situations where persons bring secular knowledge and education into the church, and sometimes that in itself can have a problem where people rely now on sociology and all these different things well, so rather than philosophy, philosophies and theories of men rather than faith in God right. and so God is seeing this and he's pointing out look come back to your first love I have a problem with this yeah. and so let's look at how what what the prescription is how does he remedy we have said last week um, in our discourse last week we said that God does not point out an error without having the antidote mm -hmm. okay and so what's the antidote what's the antidote i see that he says remember from whence you are fallen and repent mm -hmm. and do the first works mm -hmm. that's the antidote mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's not the first time we're seeing this word repent repent is synonymous <coughs> with transformation with revival, with change, there can be no change except there's repentance. And and mm -hmm. and, and and here we need to really um, consider it, you know, and know that this is what what the Lord is recommending is right, mm -hmm. because we are all um, married people. Yeah, we have our marriages, we have our spouses, our wives. And if for some strange reason we recognize that there's a measure of, of coldness or or something creeping into our marriage, mm -hmm. what do we do? Just sit down and allow it to no, go down? We have to it. find some way of rekindling, you know what I mean, That's the fire and, exactly. and lighting back the yes. sparks, you know what I mean, reinventing our relationship or something, getting something done. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the thing is it, we would have had the experience mm -hmm. of knowing this individual and know what they, he likes or she likes. Mm -hmm. for, for, for the old ladies, they will know what their husband likes. And so we can try working, going back to those four things, that, the things that made us laugh and, and all the like way back when, and try to, you know. So the Lord is saying, you walk this way and you came, retrace your steps. Come back to the force. Go back to the original doctrine. Exactly. Retrace walk your steps. in the old paths. So, it's not about, uh, the, the, you know, the, the thing is, these secular knowledge, they have their place. But when it comes to spiritual things, we've got to depend on thus saith the Lord. Exactly. And speaking of which, what are you doing? <laughs> there is this mention here where, where, where God commends the church again, this issue of the Nicolaitans, um, where he says, look, there's something I noticed that you, you, you hate, that I hate the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. What is this doctrine of the Nicolaitans all about? Brother Mentor, Brother Union, this whole understanding of the Nicolaitans, who are these people? Um, what, what, what was their profound doctrine that God hated back then? Spiritualism had started to creep into the church. Mm -hmm. Creep into the church, okay? And um, this, this, this business of, um, they, 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 they doubted certain aspects, uh, you know, about the divinity of Christ. You see, mm -hmm. so um, they were rebuked. Yes, because of these um, false doctrines, doctrines that, that, were that, that, that was that crept into the church. Mm -hmm. 
I would want to suppose right there too, mm -hmm. since they didn't accept the reincarnation of Christ. The incarnation. The, right inca the incarnation of Christ. Mm -hmm. That they also had issues with immortality, the soul. Yeah. That deeds that were done in the body did not affect the spirit. How they did that differentiation, I don't know when the Bible is quite clear on that. That from the inception, Genesis, in the Genesis account, the Lord God found man out of the dust of the ground and bred into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Yeah. So soul is made up of two entities, yeah. Yeah. dust and life force from God. Yeah. And that is the reverse. Ecclesiastes says it, right? That at that day a man died, what happened? The dust returned to the, to, the to, the, to the earth, and the life force goes back to God mm -hmm. from whence it came, okay? Um, so the, it, the, the Bible does not support immortality of the soul. No, that's, 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 um, that's a false doctrine that started since in Eden. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When, like when the devil said, <laughs> ye shall not. Just taking one word between God's statement. Mm -hmm. God said, ye shall surely die. And the devil said, ye shall not mm -hmm. surely die. Mm -hmm. Right? And, and so there are many who believe that, um, for example, one day I was talking with a young man who told me that when God made this body and then he breathed breath into it, yes. then he created a soul, something different and independent. <laughs> you know? So when somebody dies, is, is, is that the, their body dies and, 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 and their the soul lives on. Mm -hmm. So um, my, my contention to him was this, well, if the soul is a living entity by itself with, that can move around, have intelligence, etc., etc., when someone um, suffers from some measure of brain damage in an accident, why do they have to die? That, 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 that the person do not require that brain anymore, that physical brain, because they have the intellect of the soul. Uh, right. Therefore, they can uh, just yeah. use medicine and, 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 and try to help heal that and damaged and brain, and the person continues to live. Mm -hmm. You see? But yet, yet still the person dies. So I do not understand how you have an intellect could move around, and you still need this physical brain if you're something by yourself. You know, it, it's it, it not a teaching to, that is supported by the Bible. And, and we have a number of scriptures. And I want to say to those in television land, we will revisit this doctrine of the state of the, the dead, dead at right. some other time mm -hmm. when we will go in all the detail of it. But for now, uh, briefly, we can say to you that one, uh, it was Genesis 3, 22. Genesis 3, 22, when the Lord says, Behold, man is become of one of us to know good and evil. Now lest he puts forth his hand to take of the tree of life and eat and live forever. So that it was the eating of the tree of life that would have guaranteed the eternal the mort immortality. So that, we, that they would have lived, they would that's not the have point. died. And they would have lived in perfect per in, perpetual sin. Exactly. So God banished man from, from Eden and hence the scripture in Ezekiel 1820, the soul that sinned shall, shall die. die. So there is no part of the human being that circles someplace and the populace saying, somewhere around the throne of God, <laughs> you know. Somebody dies and oh, they're in a better place. You hear these things. Also, they have the um, the, the doctrine of purgatory too. When somebody <laughs> some dies, they, place. They, they, they're in a holding right. place, and, and you have to let the, some priest pray them out and all the like, and you know. Yeah. So, so as we wrap up, and it's been an interesting study talking mm -hmm. about the Church of Ephesus. We will be going through each church, and we will be discussing bits and portions of scripture that are relevant today from the experience of those particular phases of the church. So those of you in television land, we thank you for viewing for uh, viewing this program again. We want to ask you to send your texts and comments to 611 uh, 48 58 43. It's on the screen. It's on the screen. Um, P.O. Box 10, 17, 16, or Revelation in Focus, Guyana, at gmail.com. Jesus loves you. We love you. God bless.